Nicole Lapp, it's so great to see you. New York Times bestselling author, of course, spent some time in Chicagoland, and she's got a brand new book here, Miss Independent. Thank you so much for chatting with me today. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to see you. I wish I could see you IRL, not just URL. It, it, exactly. You know, it, uh, it's cold in Chicagoland, so I'm, I'm glad you're having some nice weather there in, uh, in California. Thank you. Yes, I. Um, it doesn't suck. <laughs> it, it does suck. Uh, first of all, let's go ahead and talk about, you know, we're a couple of weeks into the new year. A lot of people made, fin- you know, being financially stable, making uh, financial decisions part of their resolutions. Let's talk a little bit about maybe some debt that people got into in the holidays, or if people have those goals for maybe the summer or this year, what are some steps they can take to either, you know, try to get debt free or to make better uh, money decisions? Well, this is a really important time to focus on getting that debt monkey off your back, especially if you have credit card debt, because as you've seen the headlines, there is crazy inflation going on. I think it's going to stabilize, uh, but we are looking at interest rates potentially going higher. And so when interest rates go higher, as you know, Rudy, you know, your debt becomes more expensive. And so it's better to try to pick away at it now before we see what the inevitable is going to be. You know, interest rates have been super, super low for so long now. Now, and there's only one direction they're going to go. And so when that inevitably happens, you want to be prepared. Look, you can't control the global economy or the macro economy. You can only control what? One thing, Rudy, one thing you can control. Yourself. 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 That's, it. That's all. Your own little micro economy. So, you know, put your blinders on. I know there are a lot of scary headlines in the financial world, but the only thing you can control is yourself and your own finances. So, you know, we can control, you know, whether we're making those trips out, you know, for lunch or what we spend on the weekends or, how, you know, the luxuries that we buy ourselves. Uh, but for someone who has a lot of college debt, I mean, that's a huge deal that, you know, people are going through, especially, you know, women, two thirds of student loans are are women. And I, as I was reading the book and, you know, thinking about this interview was just that dis- disadvantage that kind of goes into, you know, once you become, you know, in your twenties or in your thirties is that you might have this extra debt that might prevent you from achieving your financial freedom when it comes to real estate or, or the stock market. Um, talk a little bit about, you know, what people can do to not maybe not get in that debt and also how they can also invest and create wealth uh, while still having that. So many things. Okay, let let me try to tackle it. So uh, first, I would say to prioritize to pulverize your debt. So not all debt is created equal. And so there are a couple of different schools of thought about how to tackle debt if you have a bunch of different kinds. There's the avalanche method and the snowball method. I like the avalanche method, which I call prioritize to pulverize. So rank your highest interest rate debt first and tackle that first. And then as you get more money, tackle the lower interest rate debts, which likely go from your credit card to your car note, if you have one, to a mortgage to your student debt, because creditors can take away your house, they can take away your car, they cannot take away your brain, thankfully. So that's why I like to really rank them that way. Like if you have a hundred bucks, you don't want to just randomly find the hundred dollar bill that you have. If that's a student loan bill, I know that that feels cathartic if you just rip it up and put it toward that. But you want to put that hundred bucks toward maybe even a bigger bill of the credit card debt. So you're chipping away at that as much as you possibly can so that doesn't get crazy and out of control. One of the things that I, you know, realized in the book is that, you know, I I think oftentimes you think of like, I'm going to get this perfect job. And if I get a promotion and I get a raise, I'm going to be able to afford the things that I want in life. And knowing that most of the people who are millionaires and and above that have multiple streams of income, they're not just relying on one, you know, one salary, you know, to, to do that. Um, Talk a little bit about maybe some places where people can look at uh, some extra sources of income. Yeah, so the average millionaire has seven streams of income. So your base salary is just one of them. Dividend income or residual income or license income or property income. There's so many different types of income. Of course, interest income that you would get from investments. And the reality is, I know this might not make me the most popular person on the show, but your base salary is actually not going to grow long-term wealth as high as that might get. Your budgeting and saving while those are awesome exercises are not going to actually grow long-term wealth. The only thing that is, is investing and taking advantage of the beautiful force that is compound interest that has often been used against us in the financial world through our credit cards. You can take that very same force of why you've been 
screwed if I can say that on this show by the, the interest rates that are working against you, you can use that in your favor and actually make your money work for you. The thing is you don't need a lot of money to make a lot of money. The thing you need most is time, the most time possible. And you're never as young as you are today. So as far as I'm concerned today is as good a day as any. Let's talk a little bit about side hustles and, you know, extra streams of, of income. I think a lot of times I know, you know, I've had these conversations with with friends and, and family members. It's that, you know, right now I'm doing great right now. I'm getting all the things that I want and then saying, oh, my goodness, we're, you know, we're expecting a child. Where is this money going to come from? Or we need to buy a house or we have to have repairs and not having that income. Should you be thinking how far in the future should be you be thinking as far as like I'm financially OK right now, but maybe next year something might come up or five years from now, you know, how often should you kind of go in and, and check in on your, on your finances? It's a great question. I like to do one, three, five, seven, ten year goals and look, goals have price tags. So if you don't know what you want for your life moving forward, and by the way, that things can change, of course, but it's important to have a roadmap too, and then reverse engineer to figure out how to get the money to live that life. So when people will say to me, yeah, I have a goal. It's to be a millionaire. Cool. Who doesn't want a million dollars? The goal is though, is what you want to do with that million dollars. So maybe you need more than a million dollars. Maybe you need less than a million dollars. I have no idea. I think it's first important to figure out the life you want. And then, you know, things happen. So you want to be able to have your own back. And I think the sweet spot is somewhere in between I'm going to live forever and I'm going to die tomorrow. (laughs) Oh, exactly. In research for the book and in just in, in your own life, is there a point where you see that parents maybe treat their sons and daughters differently when it comes to money? Is there, you know, when they're at a young age, is it teenage years? Is it you know, as far as, you know, saving up, is there, is there a point where you see that parents can take a look at themselves and say, I need to stop treating my children differently? It's a really important nuance and point. And I've looked at different studies that show little girls associate shame and fear words with money and little boys associate abundance type words with money. So we see this even with kids. And I think that for parents, I, I, often say the best thing you can do for your kids in order to raise financially strong and independent and literate uh, humans, which unfortunately they don't learn this stuff in school. If I were in charge of the world, it would totally be on the curriculum. This is a whole other segment, Uh, but is to put your oxygen mask on first and lead by example, because your kids are going to be watching you for what to do. It's obviously, you know, a little bit off topic, but they say the same thing too, with, with body issues that if they hear, you know, their parents say negative things about themselves. I think if you are in the same, you know, financial, where you don't talk shame about money of like, you know, don't tell, you know, your dad, but we went shopping here. Don't, you know, yeah. words, like, you know, words of shame associated with money that it's not like I work really hard. I'm going to buy myself this, or let's mm-hmm. put this away because in 10 years, you're going to buy your first car, or you're going to be able to go to college, or you're going to be able to buy these certain clothes or be able to make this certain investment um, where shame isn't, you know, centered around that and changing that narrative. I could not possibly agree more. Absolutely. It's such, it's such a good reminder to parents that, you know, you can focus on raising the best kids possible and with the best intentions, but focus on yourself first and make sure that you have the financial values and uh, mores that you would want your kids to have. Nicole, it's always so great to see you. Miss Independent is a brand new book. Go ahead and get it where books are sold. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much. Really great to see you next time IRL. Uh, Exactly, exactly.